Section 27 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland Volume 1 From the Beginning Until the Death of Alexander I 1825 By Shimon Dubnov Translated by Israel Friedland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by S.S. Kim Seoul, South Korea Chapter 12 The Last Years of Alexander I Part 2. 3. Judaizing sects in Russia. While the Russian authorities were dreaming of a wholesale conversion of Jews to Christianity, their attention was diverted by the ominous spectacle of huge numbers of Christians embracing a doctrine closely akin to Judaism. The Russian officials disclosed the existence of a sect of Sabbatarians and Judaizers in the governments of Boronese, Saratov, and Tula, all of them without Jewish residents, who might otherwise have been suspected of a missionary propaganda among the Greek Orthodox. The new Judaizing heresy first engaged the attention of the central government in 1817, when a group of peasants in the region of Boronese addressed a petition to the Tsar in which they naively complained of the oppressions which they had had to undergo at the hands of the local authorities, both ecclesiastic and civil, on account of their confessing the law of Moses. Acting on the imperial instructions, Golitsyn gave orders to examine most rigorously the origin of the sect for the purpose of preventing its further spread and bringing back the renegades into the fold of orthodoxy. The Greek Orthodox Archbishop of Boronies reported in substance as follows. The sect came into existence about 1796 through natural Jews. It afterwards spread to several settlements in the districts of Bovrov and Pavlovsk. The essence of the sect, without being directly an Old Testament form of Jewish worship, consists of a few Jewish ceremonies such as Sabbath observance and circumcision, the arbitrary manner of contracting and dissolving marriages, the way of burying the dead, and prayer assemblies. The number of avowed sectarians amounts to 1,500 souls of both sexes, but the secret ones are in all likelihood more numerous. To exterminate the sect, the Archbishop of Boronies proposes various measures to be carried out partly by the ecclesiastic authorities and partly by the police, among them the deportation of the soldier Anton Rovov, the propagandist of heresy. Similar reports from the ecclesiastic authorities of Tula, Olof, Saratov, and other great Russian church districts were soon received by the Synod. The Judaizing heresy spread rapidly to the villages and cities, appealing alike to peasants and merchants. Whenever taken to task, the sectarians declared that they longed to return to the Old Testament and maintain the faith of their fathers, the Judeans. The central authorities were alarmed and resorted to extraordinary measures to check the spread of the schism. The Committee of Ministers approved the following draconian project submitted by Count Kotzbay in 1823. The chiefs and teachers of the Judaizing sects are to be impressed into military service, and those unfit to serve deported to Siberia. All Jews are to be expelled from the districts in which the sect of Sabbatarians or Judeans has made its appearance. Intercourse between the Orthodox inhabitants and the sectarians is to be thwarted in every possible manner. Every outward display of the sect, such as the holding of prayer meetings and the observance of ceremonies which bear no resemblance to those of Christians, is to be forbidden. Finally, to make the sectarians an object of contempt, instructions are to be given to designate the sabbatarians as a Jewish sect and to publish far and wide that they are in reality zid, in as much as their present designation as Sabbatarians 
or adherence of the Mosaic law does not give the people a proper idea concerning this sect and does not excite in them that feeling of disgust which must be produced by the realization that what is actually aimed at is to turn them into Zs. All these police regulations, in addition to a scheme of disciplinary ecclesiastic measures proposed by the Synod for the purpose of uprooting the Judean sect, were sanctioned by Alexander I, February and September 1825. The tragic consequences of these reprisals came to light only during the following reign. Entire settlements were laid waste. Thousands of sectarians were banished to Siberia and the Caucasus. Many of them, unable to endure the persecution, returned to the Orthodox faith, but in many cases they did so outwardly, continuing in secret to cling to their sectarian tenets. 4. Recrudescence of Anti-Jewish Legislation As far as the Jews are concerned, the immediate result of these measures were insignificant. The number of Jews involved in the decree of expulsion from the affected great Russian governments was infinitesimal, since, owing to the restriction of the Jewish rights of residents, the only Jews occasionally to be found there were a few traveling salesmen or distillers. Yet, indirectly, the Judaizing movement had a harmful effect upon the position of Russian Jewry. The government circles of St. Petersburg, which were religiously attuned, were irritated by the fact that so many from the Orthodox fold went over to the camp of the very people among whom the government had been hunting vainly for proselytes, and while the colonies so hospitably prepared for the Israelitish Christians were clamoring for inhabitants, many great Russian villages had to be stripped of their inhabitants who were deported to Siberia on account of their Jewish leanings. In the mind of Golitsyn, the minister of ecclesiastic affairs, the opinion gained ground that the Jews are enjoined by their tenets to convert everybody to their religion. These circumstances produced in Russian official circles a frame of mind conducive to repressive measures and helped to provide a moral justification for them. Accordingly, the last years of Alexander I's reign were marked by a recrudescence of religious oppression which at times assumed the dimensions of wholesale persecutions. Sentiment of these kinds were responsible for the medieval prohibition against keeping Christian domestics. The prohibition was suggested by Golitsyn, a man otherwise far removed from anti-Semitic prejudices, and was officially justified in the senatorial ukase of April 22, 1820, by the alleged proselytism of the Jews. As instances of the latter, the Senate quotes the Judaizing movements in the government of Boronese, the communication of the governor of Kherson concerning certain Christian domestics in Jewish homes who had adopted Jewish customs and ceremonies and so forth. The same motives, strengthened by the tendency of removing the Jews from the villages, long since pursued by the government, suggested harsher restrictions in letting to Jews manorial estates with the peasants' souls attached to them. New cases issued in 1819 and in subsequent years enjoined the local administration to prosecute all so-called crescentia contract transactions whereby the squire leased the harvest of a given year to a Jew entitling him to employ the peasants for gathering the grain and hay and for other agricultural labors. Such transactions were looked upon as a criminal encroachment of the Jews upon the rights of owning slaves, which were the prerogative of the nobles. Orders were accordingly given that all such farm leases be taken away from the Jews in spite of the complete ruin of Jewish lessees, 
who were left to settle their accounts with the squires. At the same time, the government set out again to realize its devout consummation, the expulsion of the Jews from the villages and hamlets already provided for by the Statute of 1804, though suspended for a time when the cruelty of the measure spelling ruin to tens of thousands of Jewish families had become apparent. The arguments by means of which the Jewish committee had endeavored in 1812 to convince and finally did convince the government of the impracticability of such a migration of nations were blotted out from the memory. The local and central authorities were again on the war path against the Jews. To renew the campaign against the rural Jews, the methods which had been tried with success in the time of Tirzavin were again resorted to. When, in 1821, Hapless White Russia was again stricken by a famine which affected the Jews to a considerable extent. The local nobility was once more on the alert, placing the whole responsibility for the ruin of the peasantry on the Jewish tenants and saloon keepers. The land laws proposed that the government expel all the Jews from the province or at least forbid them to sell spirits in the rural settlements since the Jews lead the peasants into ruin. The local authorities, in reply to an inquiry of Senator Baranov, who had been dispatched from St. Petersburg to White Russia, expressed a similar opinion. The question was first brought up before the committee, which was charged with the task of giving relief to the governments of White Russia, and included several ministers, among them the all-powerful Arakchev. The Relief Committee approved the restrictive project of the nobility, and so, a little later, did the Committee of Ministers. The result was a stern new case of the Tsar, addressed on April 11, 1823, to the governors of White Russia to the following effect. 1. To forbid the Jews in all the settlements of the governments of Mogilev and Vitebsk to hold land leases, to keep public houses, saloons, hostelries, posts, and even to live in them in the villages, whereby all farming contracts of this kind are to become null and void by January 1, 1824. 2. To transplant all the Jews in these two governments from the settlements into the cities and towns by January 1, 1825. In signing this new case, which spelled sorrow and misery for thousands of families, Alexander I gave verbal instructions to the Committee of Ministers to point out to the White Russian Governor General Kovansky ways and means of obtaining employment and designating sources of livelihood for the local Jews in their new place of abode. But no ways and means of any kind could mitigate the misery of people doomed to expulsion from their old nests and reduced to beggary and vagrancy. Immediately on the receipt of the U case, the local authorities embarked upon their task with relentless cruelty. By January 1824, over 20,000 Jews of both sexes had been driven from the villages of both governments. Holes of hapless refugees with their wives and children began to flock into the overcrowded towns and townlets. There they could be seen, stripped almost to their shirts, wandering aimlessly in the streets. They lived in frightful congestion, as many as ten of them being squeezed in a single room. They were huddled together in the synagogues, while many of them, unable to find shelter, remained on the street with their families facing the winter cold. Sickness and increased mortality began to spread among them, particularly in the city of Nevel. Even the anti-Jewish governor-general Kovansky, who was making a tour of inspection through the stricken district, was stirred by the spectacle and advised the committee of ministers to stop the disastrous expulsions. But the blow had been dealt. By the beginning of 1825, 
the majority of rural Jews had been expatriated and turned out into the wide world. The question naturally arises whether this human holocaust was required in the interest of the country. The government itself gave the answer 12 years later, when it was too late. As far as White Russia is concerned, quote the Council of State in 1835, experience had not justified our anticipations of the usefulness of the indicated measure, the expulsion from the villages. Twelve years have passed since it was carried into effect, but from the data collected in the Department of Law, it is quite manifest that while it has ruined the Jews, it does not in the least seem to have improved the condition of the villages. The White Russian urge of destruction was merely the prelude to a new legislative campaign against the Jews. Almost simultaneously with the UK's ordering the expulsion of the Jews from the villages, another UK case was issued on May 1, 1823, calling for the establishment of a new committee for the amelioration of the Jews. The committee, which included among its members the ministers of interior, finance, justice, ecclesiastic affairs, and public instruction, was entrusted with a very comprehensive piece of work to examine the enactments concerning the Jews passed up to date and point out the way in which their presence in the country might be rendered more comfortable and useful, also what obligation they are to assume towards the government. In a word, to indicate all that may contribute towards the amelioration of the civil status of these people. In these soft-spoken terms was couched the public function of the committee, but its secret function, which later revealed itself in action, is correctly defined in the frank admission of the Committee of Ministers in its report of 1829. At the very establishment of the Jewish Committee, one of the obligations imposed upon it was to devise ways and means looking generally towards the reduction of the number of Jews in the monarchy. This was evidently what the amelioration of the civil status of the Jews amounted to. The new committee was instructed to finish its work by the beginning of 1824, but its reactionary activity was not fully unfolded until the following reign. In the meantime, the legal machinery did not remain idle. The process of the territorial compression of Jews went on as before. To guard the western frontier of the monarchy against smuggling, it was decided, at the suggestion of the administrator of the Kingdom of Poland, Grand Duke Konstantin Pavlovich, to expel the Jews from the border zone. Two U cases were issued in 1825, ordering the removal of all the Jews residing outside the cities within 50 versts from the frontier, with the exception of those owning immovable property. Once again, human beings were hurled from their lifelong domiciles, when a rational policy would have been content with instituting a closer watch. To prevent the undesirable multiplication of Jews in the border governments, Jewish emigrants from the neighboring countries, particularly from Austria, were forbidden to settle in Russia. 1824. Needless to say, the governments of the interior, where the Jews could sojourn only temporarily and where they had to produce gubernatorial passports, like foreigners, were carefully guarded against the invasion of the residents of the Pale. On his last trip from St. Petersburg to southern Russia in September 1825, Alexander I despite in a little village near Luga, a Jewish family which was engaged in making tin plate, and he at once inquired on what ground it lived there. The governor of St. Petersburg was frightened and gave orders to have the family deported immediately from the district to censure the local Ispravnik and to warn the gubernatorial authorities 
that the rules concerning the Jews must be observed with all possible stringency. 5. The Russian Revolutionaries and the Jews Such was the attitude of the Russian government towards the Jews. But what was the attitude of the Russian people? Considering the character of the age in which public opinion was not able to express itself even in political literature, an answer to this question would be entirely impossible had not the revolutionary movement of the Decembrists disclosed the frame of mind of the most progressive section of Russian society in its relation to the Jewish question. Taken as a whole, it was an unfriendly attitude. It reflects the utter estrangement in language, in manners and in culture between Jews and Russians at that time, an estrangement which breeds suspicion and hostility. The Russian knew no more of the life of the secluded Jewish populace than he did of the life of the Chinese. The educated Russian looked with suspicion upon the exclusiveness of patriarchal Jewish life, the unintelligible religious ceremonies which surrounded it, the rigorism of the rabbis, the ecstasy of the tzaddiks, the strange emotionalism of the Hasidic masses. If he turned to books for an explanation of these strange phenomena, he would find it in the current pamphlet literature of Germany or Poland, with its hackneyed phrases about the fanaticism of the chosen people, a state in a state, etc. The attitude of the Decembrist towards the Jewish problem reflects the conventional ideas of an age of reaction. The Russian truth by Pestel contains a chapter entitled On the Tribes Populating Russia, in which the Jewish problem is described as an almost indissoluble political tangle. Pestel enumerates the peculiar Jewish characteristics which, in his opinion, render the Jews entirely unfit for membership in a social order. The Jews foster among themselves incredibly close ties. They have a religion of their own, which instills into them the belief that they are predestined to conquer all nations and makes it impossible for them to mix with any other nation. The rabbis wielded unlimited sway over the masses. They keep the people in spiritual bondage, forbidding the reading of all books except the Talmud and other religious writings. The Jews are waiting for the coming of the Messiah, which is to establish them on their kingdom and therefore look upon themselves as temporary residents of the land in which they live. Hence, their passion for commerce and their neglect of agriculture and handicrafts. Since commerce alone is unable to provide the huge masses of Jews with a livelihood, cheating and trickery are considered permissible to the injury of the Christians. Pestel had no eye for the heavy burden of Jewish disabilities and even considers the Jews a privileged class of the population since they do not furnish any recruits, have their own rabbinical tribunals, possess the right of educating their children in whatever principles they like, and moreover, enjoy all the rights of the Christian nations. Such was the vein in which a Russian revolutionary leader wrote, not knowing, or perhaps not caring to know, of the iron vice of the Pale of Settlement, of the pitiless expulsions which were taking place just at that time, ignorant altogether of the whole mesh of legal restrictions which placed the Jews on the lowest rung of Russian rightlessness. After presenting this picture of Jewish life, Pestel suggests to the future revolutionary government, the Supreme Provisional Administration, two ways of solving the Jewish problem. One consists in breaking up the influence of the close relationship among the Jews so injurious to the Christians, because it keeps them apart from the other citizens. For this purpose, he advises convoking the most learned rabbis and the most intelligent Jews. Pestel had evidently heard of Napoleon's Sinedrion, listening to their representations, 
and thereupon adopting measures for eradicating Jewish exclusiveness. For inasmuch as Russia does not expel the Jews, they ought to be the more careful not to adopt an unfriendly attitude toward the Christians. The second way consists in an honorable expulsion of the Jews, or to use his words, in assisting the Jews to form a separate commonwealth of their own in some portion of Asia Minor. To this end, Pestel makes the proposal to choose a rallying point for the Jewish people and to supply them with some troops so as to reinforce them. For, as Pestel continues, were all the Russian and Polish Jews to congregate in one place, they would number over two millions. Such a mass of people, being in search of a fatherland, would not find it difficult to overcome all obstacles which the Turks might place in their way, and after traversing the whole of European Turkey, might pass over into Asiatic Turkey, and having occupied an adequate area, form a separate Jewish state. Pestel himself felt more attracted towards the latter alternative of solving the Jewish problem, but being fully aware that this gigantic undertaking depends on particular circumstances, he did not formulate it as a special obligation upon the supreme administration. Accordingly, if Pestel's first plan had materialized, the Jews of Russia would have received from the Supreme Provisional Administration not civil equality, but a stern reglement of the Austrian or Old Prussian type, made up of a long string of correctional measures aiming at compulsory assimilation or russification, at the demolition of the whole cultural autonomy of Russian Jewry, not excluding the right of educating their children in whatever principles they like, and finally culminating in the economic curbing of Jewry, perhaps in the spirit of that very government against which the Decembrists were fighting. Pestel's view on Judaism was shared by many Decembrists, but not by all. The constitution drafted by the leader of Northern society, Nikita Muraviov, originally proposed to grant political rights to Jews only within their pale of settlement, but in the second draft, this limitation was replaced by the principle of perfect equality. End of section 27. End of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 1 of 3, From the Beginning Until the Death of Alexander I, 1825, by Shimon Dubunov, translated by Israel Friedlander. 1876 to 1920.